Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. Welcome to Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. I'm one of your hosts, Eric, the IT guy, Hendricks. And today on episode 30, we're going to be talking about the Red Hat console. But before I do, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce the one and only Brian Smith. How are you doing, buddy? Good. How are you doing, Eric? I'm not too bad. Uh, flu's been making its way around the house, so that's always fun. But uh, probably the, the, the important news is that uh, Google Chrome decided it wanted to do an update, not, what, 10 minutes before the show started. So that's always fun, and it's always great to try and track down all the tabs, especially those tabs that you look at and go, I'm supposed to review that, wasn't I? Oops. I had the tab open. Does it, I don't know if that counts, but... Uh... Well, close enough. <laughs> so how, how are things in the Smith household? I, I, know it's been, uh, I know it's been interesting in the Hendrix household with, uh, with, with the flu going around. Yeah, no, we're doing good here. We finally got some snow, and uh, my kids had a couple of snow days off school last week, so everybody's happy around here. So, um, I, Don't tell my kids they'd be jealous because... Uh, we had snow here, but everyone was down with fevers and coughs, and it's like, as much as we would love to go out and play play with snow, uh, none of us felt great. So, uh, I'd, I've avoided it for the most part, but I, I think it's finally catching up to me today. So I may I may do this show and then go take a nap. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're we're going to talk about something that you and I are both very passionate about today. We're going to be talking about the web console known upstream as Cockpit. Uh, yes. This originally was, shall we say, marketed as something for people who are new to Linux, new to RHEL. But um, there, there, was, uh, there was a bunch of folks, and myself included, that, shall we say, took offense to that marketing because uh, I've, I've been a Linux systems administrator since 2010, officially in, in 2011. And I don't know about you, but I started... Uh, I started uh, using the web console to manage some of those tasks that are, say, more visually inclined. Uh, two things that jump to mind immediately are configuring disks partitioning and probably uh, network management, things like firewall rules. Those are just so much easier to manage if I have a visual of, of what it looks like than, uh, than if, it's, uh, if, if I'm trying to do it over command line. Yeah, no, you're 100% you're right. Um, New to Linux is definitely a use case for the web console, but it's definitely geared for people on any any um, end of the spectrum of of uh, experience with Linux. You know, like you, I've been you know I've been using Linux for going on twenty years now, um, and I use the web console all the time for for a couple of reasons. You know, it's a lot of things are just easier to do. Um, you know, quicker. There might be things like you know creating a network bond. You know, I, I don't do that from the command line on a regular basis, so I don't I don't have all that memorized. You know, all the all the command line arguments and stuff. So instead of having to look that up, I can just go into the web console and have it, you know, click click through a couple of things and have it help me out with that. So maybe our new marketing campaign should be something along the lines of not just for the new sysadmin. Yeah, yeah, def definitely, it's definitely geared for. Anyone on, on any end of the, the spectrum of, of experience, and I think as we you know later on when we actually show you some of the use cases, you know so, show, show the viewer some of the use cases, I think you'll be pretty impressed with what it can do. And well, for and those it, it you, gets better all the time. Yeah, and that's that's one thing I wanted to mention is the you know the web console or, or cockpit as it's shown upstream. This is not something new. It, it's been it's been around for quite some time. Uh, it was in RHEL seven, for example. Um, but if you haven't looked at it recently, like if RHEL 7 was the last time you've looked at it, man, a lot has changed, you know, since since then. And, and there a lot of functionality has been added in there. And we'll, we'll talk through a lot of that today. So I think I think the uh, I think the appropriate place to start is, is what is the web console and, and where did it come from? I know in the early days of uh, graphical administration on servers, uh, the the initial reaction was what? No, no, no UI on my server. Uh, uh. It's just everybody's going to hack in my server using using the UI. So that was that was where I started out. But eventually, there was uh, there's a whole suite of tools. I'm trying to think what the uh, what the package name was. It was something like uh, it was something like UX dash system dash config or something like that and there was dash config there was dash firewall there was dash there there i mean there was like 10 or 12 uh different 
uh, packages, and they all looked like they were uh, they were written in grayscale ba- back then. And um, so it there's a there's different tools that were designed to manage different aspects of of uh, of the instance, whether that was a desktop or a server. Um, but um, they they quickly got out of date. They quickly um, they they didn't look like they were great tools, and and even though we're all sysadmins, we're all used to the terminal. For some reason, we all want our our UIs to look crisp and sharp and and fresh. Uh, so they they started to fall out of favor, and so it seems like the community almost at large decided we need to fix this, and and so that's that's kind of where the cockpit project came from, um, and then eventually cockpit adopted the the pattern fly design. Uh, back end, uh, some of it's like a development kit. Some of it were, um, some of it was, uh, um, some pattern fly is a design kit. It's, it's a set of standard rules and practices. And so when, when cockpit adopted that, it really helped keep the UI sharp, responsive. And then as, as we've moved away from that, we've moved away from the suite of tools uh, and, and Terry's uh, in the chat. Uh, Terry's right. The, those tools did have uh, GUI and command line options. So I think uh, I think the CLI versions were like a TUI, a, a terminal user interface. Right. Um, so yeah, those. If someone can, uh, you, you'll you'll get uh, you'll you'll get like fifteen rel points if someone can look up what the what the name of those packages were. I don't know what those points do, but uh, uh, you'll 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 get bragging rights if nothing else. Uh, but uh, we started to move away th- from things like Vert Manager and the suite of CLI and GUI tools, and and brought them all together, and, and then put them behind a, a web a web server, which really helped standardize, secure, and and renew a lot of a lot of those tools. System dash config. That's that's what it was. I I cannot believe I couldn't remember that. So Terry now has fifteen rel points and. Um, don't don't ask because I don't know what those are for. But you've you've got some congratulations. Yeah, we, no, yeah, we did, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say no. Yeah, you're you're, you're absolutely right. So the, the web console is is unifying a lot of you know separate um, utilities we've had in the past. You know that were kind of um, disjointed and 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 you know not unified. So the web console kind of brings all that together, and the web console comes with you know, a, a, like a, kind of a default set of functionality, but then you can also install additional packages um, if you want additional functionality. So for example, the, the on-premise image builder, um, that package is not installed by default with Cockpit, but you can install that if you'd like additional functionality. So the idea is, um, you know, as we have different management needs for, uh, within RHEL, um, we can expand Cockpit um, in this modular format to, to add additional functionality into it. So what what was your first experience with with cockpit? Yeah, so my first experience with was during rel seven, um, you know, and and trying it out there and um, and it was you know in rel seven it was it was very you know very useful, but there were some gaps. You know, there were definitely some some you know normal day to day administration ta- tasks that you'd want to do that were not available in in uh, web console, and so. Um, with, with the release of RHEL 8, and then with each of the minor versions of RHEL 8, we've um, added more and more functionality into the web console. And I'm really excited to, to show off some of that later on in the in the episode here. Um, so mine was actually with Cockpit in Fedora. Uh, okay. So I I stumbled upon, uh, I didn't even realize that RHEL had uh, a, uh, I didn't realize that RHEL had adopted that for some time. And uh, I'd, might have been Brandon or, or one of my other colleagues uh, as I was just getting started. It was like, we, we should totally adopt cockpit and put it in rel. And the response was, uh, bro, we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's called the web UI. You should go look. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the rel expert around here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But, uh, so one of the things I wanted to address right up front was, uh, for a lot of our veteran systems administrators, we get uh, we get this question quite often: Does Cockpit replace, or does the Web UI replace the command line? And I I, I want to get your take on this, but my my gut reaction is always no, it absolutely does not. There, uh, the more complex an operation you're trying to do, uh, the more um, involved an operation. 
the less useful, co uh, sorry, the, the web UI is going to be. Um, but <clears throat> for me, when I, when I start on a task, the first place I go is definitely to, uh, to the web UI. Can I, can I do this easily using the web tool? If not, then I, then I go and pull up, I, I pull up the man page or let's be honest, Google and, uh, and find the right arguments. Cause it's, it's, it's always a struggle of, is that a capital R or a lowercase R? And does that go before or after the, the variable, um, man, I wish there was a cockpit, uh, operation for this. Right. Yeah. Command line is definitely not going anywhere. Um, uh, and, and the fact is within the web console, you can even get to the command line. Uh, you know, part of the web console is a terminal application that allows you to, to run any arbitrary command you'd like to. So the web console definitely has a, a large scope, but it's, it's definitely not, um, not ever going to replace the command line. And there's, there's certain things where it's easier to, you, you've, you've run this command a thousand times. Um, and you just, you have it, you have it memorized. It's muscle memory. Go to the command line. It's, it's there. One of the reasons why I was drawn to Linux over, uh, over my windows systems ad administrator days was it seemed like Microsoft or some of the other GUI based, uh, systems, uh, especially in the networking world would change their UIs every, every major release. And it's like, okay, this used to be under this menu. Now I got to click, click, click. And, um, six menus later, you might find what you're looking for. And someone asks, Hey, where is that? It's like, uh, I'm not sitting in front of a server right now. So unless you can share your screen and I can kind of mentally click through to remember where everything is, it's, it's like trying to remember the song lyrics without having the song playing. Yep. Whereas the command line, it's the same. And for the most part is as long as that operating system, as long as that distribution followed some of the typical Unix rules, the command was exactly the same, no matter whether you're, you're using Fedora or RHEL or one of the other distros. Um, even from even if they had their roots in something like BSD, it was still the same no matter where you went. <coughs> so before we dive any deeper, uh, we've, we do have a question in chat uh, from... Um, from one of one of our uh, very quickly becoming a regular, uh, so I personally don't know of a way that the uh, that cockpit can export a command, but maybe maybe you can speak a little bit deeper into this. Yeah, so that's a good question. So so cockpit is not actually running commands to, to accomplish the task. It's actually interacting directly with APIs um, to to accomplish the different you know tasks that it's doing so there's not there's not any way to export um, like the command out of there because it's not actually running a command it's directly interacting with with um with, with the various apis now with that said there is some functionality um uh, within the web console where like for example with se linux it can generate um a command that you could run on more than one host to address the issue right so it so, for example, if there's an SE Linux issue, it can, uh, in some cases, identify an Ansible snippet you can run to fix the issue or a command you can run to fix the issue. And you could copy and paste that and run it on multiple machines. Um, that's that's pretty limited right now, though, to the SE Linux section of a web console. But that's a kind of an idea and, and a concept we're you know, hoping to expand on in the future. Yeah, uh, it's... And, and and as we kind of transition into some of the use cases, I think that's a good point to bring up early on. Is Cockpit is really a one-to-one -one management uh, system. If if you're looking to manage ten, hundred, a thousand systems, you're much better off looking into Ansible playbooks or some sort of infrastructure as code uh, type of a setup, or or maybe even. Um, maybe even something like building certain configurations into the the golden image that you're using to deploy the rest of your environment. So it, it very it, it 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 is very much limited to a one to one. Yeah, so yeah, so the web console is definitely focused on managing individual machines. There there is some functionality though where you can you can switch between hosts very quickly and easily. You can set up SSH keys and so I can jump from you know the web console on this machine to the to the web console on a different machine very quickly and easily, and then we also have some functionality that that I'll demo later on within Satellite where you can optionally um, enable the web console integration. And once you do that, from within within Satellite, you can pull up a host, click on the web console button, it'll automatically log you in and and put you at the web console, so you can you know very quickly jump around uh, like that as well. 
Um, and then, as you said, yeah, if you want to, if you really want to manage RHEL on a large scale, that is definitely where RHEL system roles come in, which is our collection of supported uh, Ansible playbook or Ansible roles and, and collections that you can use to automate all kinds of stuff on RHEL. So um, definitely would encourage anyone interested in that to look up RHEL system roles. We, we've covered uh, uh, several of them on this show, yep. and I know we yep. have plans to cover some more uh, in the coming weeks and months. Yep. Um, of course, it helps that uh, that Brian is one of our product managers that oversees our system roles. So, um, to take that to mean what you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also I also oversee the web console too. So I I, I, equal, I equally love real system roles and the web console. So. <laughs> So many things to say about that, but uh, I, we'll, we'll carry on. <laughs> so one, one use case that uh, I use personally that I'm really excited about is uh, that uh, with each release of Cockpit and, and then within you know, one to six months later, depending on where it is in the, in the RHEL release cycle, is virtual machine management through Cockpit. This is absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, with with eight, eight, what are we on now? Sorry, I'm prepping for eight six and nine zero. Uh, so with with eight five, just in November, we released the ability to, uh, I believe it was to take snapshots, or maybe that was eight uh, three. Anyway, within the last year or so, we, uh, cockpit and uh, uh, and then later the web UI got the ability to take snapshots of virtual machines, which is awesome because you can you could. You could pause your, you could you could stop your virtual machine, take a snapshot, and then uh, go try that weird thing that you found on on Stack Exchange, and you hope works, but don't want it to break your system. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So okay. for anyone who likes to read through the release notes for REL, which I think everyone here does, right? Um, I do. Yeah, yeah. So you'll 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 have noticed in in REL a the the release notes mention that Vert Manager is uh, deprecated. And uh, the web console is the um, is now the preferred method of of managing virtual machines on RHEL. So, and we'll we'll show some of this later on in the demo. But yeah, um, and that is something like you said. You know, every release we've added um, you know new functionality into the, the the virtual machine management portions of of Cockpit, and it's really come a long ways. And it's it's there's really it's very powerful at this point. So I actually use a couple of the features that you just mentioned. So I'd, I'd, I'd hinted that I use uh, RHEL 8.5 here in my home lab um, to manage uh, all the virtual machines that are running in my home lab. I only have the one host right now, uh, and it, I put plenty of resources into it. Um, although if someone wants to buy me a late Christmas present, uh, I maxed out on RAM, so a new motherboard would be great. <laughs> but... Uh, I actually use Cockpit to manage all of my virtual machines. And then uh, I actually have a jump box that I've set up SSH keys between the different hosts to this jump box so I can actually use the web UI to look at performance for all of my systems. Um, so it gives me a quick, a quick graph if, if, my, if my hardware is, is, is uh, running really heavy. Uh, I can very quickly just go to my jump box. I can I can log into the web UI. I can look at the performance metrics and say, oh, it's this server. Uh, it's usually Plex because my kids and my wife and myself all fight for bandwidth on the Plex server. So, um, <laughs> so that's uh, that's usually the one that screams for attention. Um, what other uh, use cases can you uh, can you think of, Brian? Yeah. So, like you mentioned, performance troubleshooting is a really big one, and that's something. Um, with with rel 8.4 we added um, some new uh, new capabilities as far as looking at historical performance graphs um, identifying when when resource usage spikes occur automatically and, and stuff like that and with, and then with rel 8.5 we've expanded on that as well where not only will the web console you know show you when a resource usage spike occurred it'll also show you the corresponding log files that are, that occurred around that the same time as, as that spike so that'll help you you know, have a have a place to start when you're troubleshooting you know what might have uh, led to the performance issue so that's definitely a a, a big use case is all around the performance um, uh, troubleshooting um we, we mentioned you know vm management that's ob obviously another important uh, use case um and and new to linux this is definitely one as well like if, if you're in an environment where 
Um, if it's a smaller team, maybe um, you share responsibilities with like a Windows administrator um, and they need to cover uh, rel administration like after hours are on call and maybe they're not you know super familiar with the Linux command line. Um, you can you know quickly um, take someone and get them up to speed with how to do the basics of system administration through the web console uh, very, very quickly and easily. Um, I even I even wrote a blog post out on enable sysadmin where I did a little experiment with my six-year-old son. I, I I handed him his tablet, logged into the web console, and I gave him a list of things to to try to do. And it was pretty impressive. He he was able to do almost everything just on his own. And so I mean it, it really is that intuitive and, and easy to use. So um, I'll, we'll uh, we'll see if we can track that blog down because uh, I'm I'm all for indoctrinating our children young to use RHEL. Or at least Fedora. Um, so, I, so forgive me if I butcher this, but Shanatu in uh, in chat actually brought up an interesting question, um, talking about I feel config management software for more than ten machines is slow poison. I prefer baking things into an image for cloud, but runtime things using something else. Um, and I think that's where um, I think that's where uh, things like system roles come into into help uh, because uh, because that hold on pause form form words and then and then speak um, things like system roles you actually can uh, you can actually take the configuration and save it into a text file and either embed that into an image or maybe if it's like we we talked we talked not too long ago about SQL Server uh, that has a it, it has a system role as well. Uh, so you don't necessarily want to bake in SQL Server to your entire fleet of systems. So that's an area where having that uh, having that system role and the and the uh, corresponding configuration file sitting out on a, on a Git repository or something, and then deploying that with Ansible using using something like a tag or a host name um, can help call and say, "Oh, look, I'm I'm a SQL box." So go go to the Git repository and anything that's tagged for SQL. Then I run those commands. Right. So you're right. Up to up to ten machines, a, a single administrator can handle that. In fact, I I read a study a few years ago that uh, before kind of infrastructure as code and heavy automation, it was like one to a hundred, one sysadmin for every hundred servers. Granted, I was in multiple environments where that was like ten x. So it was like one to a thousand. And I was also the backup guy, the storage guy, and the Iron Mountain tape dispenser guy, and the backup uh, networking guy, and they could not get me onto Windows because I, I just said, no. If you want me to do all these other things and be the only Linux guy, I ain't touching Windows. <laughs> <laughs> and surprisingly, they said, oh, okay, that's fine. It's like, wait, should I have, should I have bargained for more? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and on and on that thought of you know baking things into the image, you know, Red Hat is is doing a lot with with Image Builder, um, so that you know that's something where you can customize uh, you know what packages you have in your image, and and um, you can also do things like satellite with provisioning templates. You can do a lot there to have um, you know systems provisioned and then have you know customizations done, and you can even with with satellite, you can provision a host and then have it call back to uh, Ansible Automation Controller to run a run a playbook from your Ansible Automation platform. So there's all kinds of different methods and technologies that you can use to get your systems up and running and to a standard configuration. And, and Red Hat has a lot of different you know, a lot of different options depending on what what preference you have. So as we as we kind of transition into the um into kind of the show and tell portion. So I, as I kind of switch gears here, uh, I did notice that Scott in the chat called you out on uh, which you loved more. Um, you, if you had to pick, do you love the web UI or do you love system roles? You, if you had to pick. <laughs> Man, you guys are putting me on the spot here. I, I, he I, called I, you out, so. I can't, I can't answer, I can't answer. <laughs> All right, cool. So. All right, yeah, we'll we'll have to shame him later, Scott. But uh, <laughs> so why don't why don't you uh, why don't you tell us what what you got here, and we'll uh, we'll we'll kind of dive in through some of the different windows. Yeah. So so I'm logged in here on a rel 8.5 system into the web console. So a couple things to know on on most installs of of rel 8, you're going to have 
the cockpit packages installed by default. However, they're not they're not enabled the the socket. So you just need to basically enable the cockpit socket with a system CTL command, and then you'll be able to um, go to the server's host name or IP address on port ninety ninety. At which point you can log in to the web console, and, and you log in with um, the same um, authentication system you'd use to log in over SSH. So whatever you have set up for there, you can you can use to log in um, to the web console with the same usernames and passwords that you would normally log in over SSH. Um, <clears throat> once you're once you're logged in to the web console, um, you're you're by default placed into this this overview screen that has kind of a, a snapshot of what state the system is in. So it'll tell us if there's bug or security fixes uh, available. Um, if we click on this link, it would jump us over to the to the system update portion of, of the web console. Um, this system isn't registered insights, but if it was registered insights, it would show us if there were any um, rules uh, for, for insights that I needed to look at. And I could click on that and, and link into console.redhead.com. Um, and then uh, down below, we have some system information, you know, talking about uh, what kind of system we're on here. We can click on view hardware details and get a lot more information. Um, and then under configuration here is just kind of the really basic high level um, configuration of the system. We can see the host name and we can click uh, edit and we can even change the host name if we'd like to rename the host. Uh, we can see the time. We can change the time. Uh, we can specify we would like to use NTP or manually set the time. Um, we can even do things like join a, uh, a domain. Um, and we can look at the, um, the Tune D performance profile. So we could, we could easily change the uh, performance profile that we have set on the system, as well as show the, the SSH uh, key fingerprints for, for the machine. Um, the usage here, we'll go into more detail on this, but this is a this is a real time snapshot of what the resource usage is, is on the system right now. So I can see, you know, I have four CPUs. I can see how much they're utilized, as well as the amount of memory and the utilization. Um, and then finally, up here, I have an option I can shut down or reboot uh, this host if I'd like to do that. Yeah, the the overview on this has absolutely no erroneous information. I, I find every one of these boxes, except maybe the system information section, because I don't need to know what what hardware I'm running. But um, but you know I'm not managing for a large uh, data center, um, right. so uh, while that's not helpful for me, I can definitely see where every one of these boxes is is helpful. And right. I, I noticed under host name that there's even set a pretty host name, which I got kind of excited about. <laughs> but. Uh, I mean, the, just the real-time CPU usage, it, it's so nice to go under, say, like the services and spin up a service and then come back to the, to the overview and, and watch your CPU spike and just know that, okay, it's, it's doing something. So, and, and being able to connect out to insights to get more information about certain vulnerabilities. I mean, it, every, every little section in this, in, in this overview is so helpful. Well, yeah, let's, and let's, drill down a little bit more into the performance stuff. So if I click on this view details and history, I'm gonna get a lot more information about what's going on in the system. So uh, this entire section at the top here, this is again, is all the real time statistics. So this is a snapshot of right now, what is the performance on the system? So I can quickly see you know, the, the CPU and if I hover over here, it'll actually show the, the individual cores and their utilization. I can see the load average and then I can see a breakdown of the uh, the, the services that are using the most CPU. And then likewise on, on the memory, I can see the RAM and swap and the top memory consumers uh, services here. And then I can also see uh, my disk uh, read and write uh, metrics, as well as an overview of the file systems I have on the machine and what their utilization is. And, and later on in the, in the demo here, we'll actually create a file system um, using the web console and we'll see that get populated here. And then over on the network, we can see all our different interfaces and again, see that real time snapshot of, of what the performance is looking like on those. Now, the, the, what I was mentioning earlier, you know, with rel 8.4, we added some new capability as far as the um, historical performance graphs. So up here at the top, this is, this is the current snapshot, but down here is a historical 
snapshot, a historical graph of what the performance has been on the system. So we can see our CPU, uh, memory, uh, disk IO, and network. And we can scroll down here. And what's cool is um, the web console will identify when there's been a resource you should spike. So we can see over here the network really uh, spiked here. Um, and we can click this little drop down and we can see if there was any log entries that occurred on the system around that same time. So this could be something that we could use as a starting point to narrow down what possibly might have been the cause of that, that resource you should spike. And then of course, if we'd like to see you know previous days, we can go up here and, and hit the drop down and, and you know look at the, the graphs for yesterday or, or you know a, a previous date. So this is you know super useful anytime you're on a rail machine and you want to see what's going on as far as the performance. You want to see what's going on right now. You want to see what was like earlier in the day, for example. This is a great starting place to, to take a look at that information. And you know how many commands we just saved ourselves from running? I mean, between top and H top and right. N top and PS dash EF. And yeah. I mean, and then having to go in and sort your sort your graph based on CPU, based on memory. Yeah. I mean, just the amount of uh, of investigation time that using just the performance metrics uh, uh, dashboard saves us is unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, if if you're pegged at 100% CPU, you don't have to go and 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 and, and kind of dig around. I mean, the top five processes are right there, and they're updated right. about every five seconds or so. I mean, it's just I, I cannot I I cannot oversell the web UI. Yeah. <laughs> And then let's talk a little bit about, you know, you're, you're talking about like multi-host management. So let's let's talk about that just, just briefly. So um, I also have a satellite uh, system set up here and I've enabled that optional uh, integration with the web console. And so once I've enabled that, um, I can go down and, and pull up, um, you know, any one of my hosts that's connected to satellite, uh, click on it here under all hosts, and then I'll have this web console button and so I'll click on this web console button and you'll notice it automatically logs me in. So this is using the, um, the satellite remote execution framework um, to, to do the authentication and log me in. Um, but this functionality will allow you to, you know, very quickly, you know, jump from satellite into a rel system um, to dig to, you know, to drill down to get more information or to perform troubleshooting. So that's, that's one way you can, you can do some multi-host management. And then the other way is once you're uh, once you're in the web console, you have this little drop down up here and you can um, add more hosts into this list, right? So you can click on add new host here, um, give it a, a host name and username um, and, and password and it'll connect in and it'll offer to set up an SSH key for you automatically if you'd like to. Um, once you set up the SSH key, um, you'll then have in the list here multiple hosts, and I'm logged into this rel 8.5 host, but I'm going to click on this rel 9 beta host, and you can see I'm now switched over into the web console on this other host, and everything I do here will now affect that host, and I can jump back you know, to rel 8.5, my original host, uh, anytime I'd like to. And, and for clarity, you said that was based on SSH keys, right? Yeah, so... Um, Yes, is exactly. So this is going to um, set up a, a an SSH key to allow you to authenticate into the other host. Um, with satellite, it's also um, it's also using the remote execution SSH keys. Um, one other kind of cool thing is <clears throat> when you set this up with satellite, uh, you don't have to have the uh, web console or cockpit um, socket enabled on your target host, right? It's not. It's not actually going through port 9090 when you go through this method using a satellite, it's connecting over SSH and um, you don't have to have cockpit enabled on the host at all. You just have to have it installed on the host. If that oh, makes nice. sense. I actually yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. And if you want to, um, if you want to get more information on this, um, this is a blog post I have out on enable sysadmin. And this talks all about how to set up the, um, the web console integration with satellite. It's really easy to do. Um, and, and this this blog outlines all the information you need to know. All right, cool. Um, do we have any questions in the chat on, on any of that? Or should we go on and... Um, go on. 
there's there's been kind of consensus that uh, the disk management is probably one of the biggest uses for uh, for the UI. <clears throat> okay. Let's talk about that then. Um, all right, cool. So what I'm going to do is jump down into this storage section here. Okay. And you'll notice a common theme um, with a lot of these different panels. Um, in, in, in most cases, they'll have um, some performance stats up here at the top. <clears throat> they'll have some information you can use to configure the system here. And then down at the bottom, they'll have, um, log, you know, log entries so you can um, see logs related to storage. So what we can do in, in this case is let's, let's create a new volume group, a new logical volume, and a new file system um, on, on this system. So to do that, I can go up here to this little blue, um, the blue lines up here, and I can click on uh, create volume group. Okay, it's going to ask me for um, a volume group name. So I'll just call it uh, my VG. And then I can select um, what uh, devices I'd like to add into this uh, volume group. So I'll just add this 10 gig disk that I have on the system that's currently unused. Okay, go ahead and click on create. Okay, and I now have the volume group created. So I can click on my volume group up here in the upper right. Okay, and um, let's create a logical volume on this as well. So I'll click on create a new logical volume. And let's call this uh, my LV. Okay. And these, these names are just inspired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I can, I have this little, this little slider here where I can say, you know, how big would I like this logical volume to be? So I'm going to make it, let's just make it, you know, about two and a half um, gigabytes. Or actually, I can just hit the drop down here. Let's just, yeah. I was actually right on there. Yeah, two and a half gigabytes. All right, so let's go ahead and create this. Okay. And now that we have the logical volume, we probably want to put a file system on it. So we can just click on format. And let's call this, um, how about my file system? I never saw that coming. <laughs> and I'll create a mount point <laughs> my FS, okay? And we can, you know, we can choose what type of file system we'd like. We'll leave it on the, the, the default, which is XFS, okay? And then we'll go ahead and click on format. Okay, and that's it. We, we, we just created a, a volume group, a logical volume, and a file system. So let's jump down to the terminal. So I had mentioned earlier, you know, the web console has all this functionality, but it also has down here at the bottom, the terminal, which allows you to, you know, get a bash shell and run any arbitrary command you'd like. So let's um, CD over to my file system. And um, let's just look and see if it actually mounted. So we'll run a DF here and we can see, uh, we have my VG and, and my LV uh, mounted here at my file system and it's um, two and a half gigabytes. So let's let's do this. Um, I'm going to I'm going to fill up this file system uh, on purpose. I'm going to um, just run a DD here. So we'll say dev zero. Okay. We'll say block size is one megabyte and output file uh, dot slash test file uh, counts equals. So this is going to create a file that's basically three gigabytes, and the file system is two and a half gigabytes. So we're going to uh, run out of space here. So let's jump back over to our usage. We can see the my, my file system here now, and we can see that was going up. It's now red, <clears throat> indicating that it's um, you know almost full. We we'll go back to the terminal here, and we can see um, you know we ran out of space. So this this is filled up. So let's add some more space into this file system, you know, because this is a common task you have to do on, on, on RHEL with file systems is increase the space as, as your DBAs use up all the, all the space as we, <laughs> as we all know. <laughs> Never met a DBA who doesn't want more space on a file system. So it's like you watched my career from, from day one. <laughs> yeah. So let's jump back up to storage here. Okay. Um, we, we have our, our uh, logical volume here and we'll go ahead and click on grow. Okay. And we can, you know, we can choose, let's just make it the, the, the entire, the entire disk here, the, the rest of the space that we have free. Go ahead and click on grow. And just like that, we have, we resized that file system. If I go back here, 
you can see, you know, originally it was about two and a half gig. It's now, it's now 10 gig. So let's make this, let's make, let's, let's make this a little bit more real world though. Okay. So, so Eric, I imagine you were a sysadmin for, for quite some time, right? Yep. About, about a decade. And so I, so I imagine you had quite a few times where you were on call, right? Did, did you ever get called at a bad time when, when you were on call Did that? Oh no, no, never. A never. Anytime I was on call, I locked myself in a closet with, with nothing but a cell phone and a laptop. Right, right, right. Yeah, because I was. I was but I, I, I had coworkers who were. <laughs> <laughs> so I was also a seven for a long time and on call, <laughs> on call for many years, and 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 it, I don't know how it always happened, but it was always the worst time. So right. So let's set the stage here a little bit. So let's let's imagine, Eric, that you're you're on call, okay? You're going out to to dinner to a nice restaurant with your family. Okay, you've you've ordered your meal, you know, about twenty minutes ago. You, you know, they're, they're going to be bringing out your food any minute now, right? And you get a call from your boss. You know, hey, Eric, you know, this this file system, this file system here, um, it's full. I need to drop everything. We need this We need this fixed as soon as possible. The, the database is down. The DBA is needed up. So, you know, previously, you know, best case scenario, hopefully you had left your laptop in the trunk of your car, right? And so you go out to your car, you're probably looking at 15 or 20 minutes to boot up your laptop, get all logged in, um, you know, add the, add the space. You, you left, you left out the part where you're, where you're cursing your Verizon MiFi because you can't get your <laughs> laptop and the MiFi to that's, connect. That's true. So you end up just saying, all right, forget it. I got to call you back. My MiFi is not working. So you hang up on the phone and then you connect your laptop to your phone and then you get connected so you can actually log in, but the signal's terrible. Uh, so it takes you about, six times longer to get to a terminal than it was before. You, you, you kind of forgot that minor detail. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so best case, if you, if you had your, you had your laptop, you had your hotspot, everything was, you know, the stars all aligned. You're, you're probably looking at 15 or 20 minutes. You come back in, your food's cold, your family's already eaten, you know, but you know, if you didn't have your lap, your laptop in your trunk at that point, you're, you're probably going home. How's your family going to get home after they, eat? you know, if you get a taxi or, you know, who knows? So, you know, what, what if I told you you could manage rail from your cell phone? Would that, would that be kind of a game changer in this kind of scenario here? I would tell you you're crazy. <laughs> so with, say, say it ain't so. <laughs> so with rail, so with rail eight, one of the things that, that was um, added in the web console is the ability to, manage rel through the web console through a mobile um a mobile device browser okay so um so what i'm gonna do here is simulate that um you know it wouldn't be easy for me to hold a phone and, and try to show here so but with chrome um i can press f12 and then we have this um this ability to to simulate a mobile phone device browser for you know for development purposes and can you uh can you blow that up at all it's just real hard to see on the stream see if I can just make that a little bit bigger. I can probably. It's not letting me zoom. Is that any better? Nah, it's it's more blurred now. But I, okay. I think it kind of makes a point. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to just do the, the web browser zoom in, but it's not it's not zoom. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that helped a little bit. Okay. So this is what it would look like, you know, from a from a mobile device, um, instead of having the menu over here on the on the left, it's down here on the bottom. Okay, so you can click on system here; it'll it'll pop up the menu. And so mm. from you know from Love a phone, it. we can we can do everything that we that we talked about. The one caveat here is you have to have some kind of VPN access from your phone to get into your network, uh, your your corporate network. You have to be able to connect to port ninety ninety um, on the host to be able to log into the web console. That's the main caveat with this. But once you have that set up. Um, you can log into the web console. We can go back to storage. Okay, um, let's go back to the storage view here, and we can see my file system is full. It's completely full. Um, so what we want to do is, you know, let's try to add some more space to that. So let's click on the my volume group, um, the logical volume here. Um, uh oh, we have the the grow button is grayed out now, though. Say not enough space to grow. 
that's because before we used it, you know, we used up all the space in the volume group, right? Our, our volume group had one disk in it. Um, our volume group is now at capacity. But what we can do is we can add another physical volume into this volume group just by clicking the plus sign here. Um, we can click, you know, the, an additional device that's unused on the system, click add. Okay, volume group is now 15 gig. We can click on grow. Just, you know, swipe up however much space we want, click on grow. And that's it. We just, you know, we just from a, you know, mobile device browser, we just were able to um, add in a, an additional disk into the line group and expand that file system and just in time for dinner, right? So this is much easier than, you know, having to boot up a laptop. You know, you can just very quickly and easily uh, manage, you know, your system from, from a mobile device like this. I actually don't think I'd ever pulled up cockpit on my phone before. I had on my tablet, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's an iPad. So it, it doesn't look all that much different, but right. I mean, this is amazing from a phone and this is, this is what makes me feel like I'm an, I'm a geezer when it comes to sysadmins because I literally caught myself in, in a community group the other day going, you young, you young sysadmins have no idea how good you have it these days and went to explain how it was in my day. And just because your, your example is, is spot on. And I had something just like that happen to me. And I was out at the car with my laptop on my trunk. My phone kept sliding down off the trunk. So I had it propped up on speakerphone because I wasn't cool enough to have Bluetooth at the time propped up on on the back windshield and yep. my girlfriend or fiance it was a birthday uh she was not happy with me <laughs> and so yeah what what you're speaking is is absolutely true and i think anyone who's been a sysadmin for any yep. length of time can definitely relate to that yeah but and, uh this, another, this would be awesome and another thing you know when i was on call i always felt like i was had to be tethered to the laptop, I couldn't go out for a bike ride or you know go out for a hike or something where I didn't have my laptop with me. Well, as long as you have your phone and, and cell phone service, you, you know you can you can still manage your rail systems right from your cell phone. You don't have to be tied down to your laptop all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this this would have been awesome to have back yeah. in the day. So let's look at some of the other some of the other stuff. Um, and here is we're man we're running out of time fast. <clears throat> so let's. I'll, I'll try to move through some of this a little bit faster. So let's let's jump in. We'll, let's kind of go through all these different panels and, and just real quickly highlight what you can do from them. So networking, again, follows that same uh, similar format where we have some performance graphs here at the top. And then down at the bottom, we have some, some log files related to networking. Um, we can manage the firewall. So I can click on firewall here. Uh, my public zone, if I'd like to add an additional service, I can click, you know, add service. And let's say I want to add Grafana. Um, you know, open that up in, the, in my firewall. I can search for that. Click here, add service. That's now open in my uh, public zone in the firewall. Super quick and easy to do. Um, let's talk a little bit about networking. So we can, you know, obviously go in here and, and look at our current network interfaces. You can also do things a little bit more complicated to do from the command line, like, you know, for example, adding a network bond. If I click on this add bond button, I can select some unused interfaces on the machine. Okay, I can specify things like, you know, what kind of mode I want to have this bond set up with. Um, if I'd like to specify um, a primary interface, et cetera, I have all these different parameters. I can click on apply. And I now have my bond um, uh, interface created. And I could go in here and, um, you know, set a, a manual IP address on it if I'd like to. And it's really, you know, that, that quick and easy to set up there. Um, Containers, you know, containers are um, always something people are interested in learning more about and, and, and trying out on RHEL. So let's talk a little bit about that. So we can um, click on this, this get new image, okay? And, and we can specify what registry we'd like to look into. So let's look in the uh, registry.access.redhat.com and we'll search for UBI, which is our um, universal, universal base image, container image. Okay, and let's um, let's just grab this uh, UBI seven, which is the rel seven version of the UBI, and we'll go ahead and download that. <clears throat> so this is going to pull down this image, the the latest tag, down to our machine here, 
And then once we have that downloaded, we can actually run the container um, right here from the web console using Podman and even do things like pull up a terminal uh, window uh, within the within the container and see, you know, run commands and see what's going on within the container. So this should just take a few seconds here and um, we'll show how that works. Do you have any other questions in the chat while we're waiting for that? Uh, no, I, okay. I think we've been covering things as, okay, as they've cool. come out. Okay, so, all right, we have the image downloaded. I'm gonna click the little play button over here. It's gonna give me a randomly generated name like, like Podman normally does. Um, I can specify, you know, memory limits, CPU shares, et cetera. Specify what command I'd like the, to run. So go ahead and click on run. Okay, I've now spun up a new container here. And hit this little drop down. You can see the log logs from that. Um, uh oh, let's see if we got an error here. Failed to parse parameters. So There's let's something try. about this show and demonstrating containers <laughs> that just doesn't work out. <laughs> Yeah, where's wouldn't, Scott? Be, wouldn't be a live demonstration unless something broke. Yeah, where's, where's Scott McCarty? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's try that again. Actually, for the sake, we're almost out of time. For, for the sake of time, let's just keep moving. But yeah, normally you can pull up the console and you can run commands within the container. Um, we'll, we'll Actually, try uh, I, I was just uh, reminded that we did have a question. Let me see if I can can bring that back up. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I can't find the original question, but I know that uh, uh, I know the question was based around: Can you stop and start cockpit and still maintain some of the historical uh, performance data? Yeah, so the performance data is is being gathered by uh, Performance Copilot, um, also known as PCP. Um, so yeah, so I believe as long as you still have Performance Copilot running, um, the the, 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 that information will still be there. The other thing to keep in mind is that cockpit is not really necessarily running. Um, you, you enable the socket and then that tells, you know, basically um, system D if someone connects on port 9090 to, you know, spin up a cockpit process to, to receive that connection. But if nobody's connected to cockpit, it's using zero resources on your system, right? So there's, um, there's really no, no need to, you know, worry too much about performance and stuff. Again, it's zero performance usage unless someone's logged in. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you're using it from something like satellite, you don't even need to enable cockpit on the machine. You just you just um, uh, install the cockpit packages, which are there by default on Rel8, and um, satellite will initiate the connection into it. And you don't have to even have the socket enabled on the on the host. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about VM management. So, um, let's create a new VM on here. So. <clears throat> I'm going to spin up a Fedora VM. Um, you can you can specify if you'd like to download an OS. It, we, we have several operating systems listed in here that you can download automatically, or um, you can do um, a local install if you already have the ISO downloaded, which I do. So I'll, I'll point it to a Fedora 34 ISO, um, give this a little bit more memory, and we'll go ahead and click on Create. So this is going to create my new my new uh, virtual machine here. I can click on the link here, and I can see you know I have the console for the virtual machine here, and you know of course you can go through and um, change things like memory and CPU. Some some of these you have to have the machine shut down to change, um, but you can go through and, and do your basic VM configuration. Um, you know you can add and remove disk from the from the VM. Um, work with network interfaces, um, and then look at any host devices that are passed through to the virtual machine. So you have all your basic VM functionality, you know, available here. And then if you have little drop downs here, you can, you know, shut down the VM or, or do other other tasks here. So, so, so this is your, your you know your your recommended virtual machine management solution here for RHEL, um, right here within the web console. And I got to say, using the graphical console to manage virtual machines is probably the thing I use the most. Yeah. Uh, I try and SSH into my into my box from my jump my jump machine. It's not working. I can just very quickly go into virtual machines, look at the one in question, look at the console and go, oh, it was it was running a disk check and timed out or something. Exactly. Exactly. If we jump so into it. Yeah, we, sorry, go we ahead. do need to we do need to kind of start wrapping up. Okay. Uh, but 
maybe uh, I, I know we haven't finalized features, so keep in mind this is this is projected information. But if uh, if someone were to look at Fedora and look at the the cockpit. Uh, features. Uh, I know a lot of those have been slated for RHEL nine. Are we? Uh, can we potentially share what some of those uh, some of those features coming in RHEL nine are? Yeah, yeah. So let me jump over to my RHEL nine beta <clears throat> system here. So a couple of the a couple of the new things that are coming um, are the ability to uh, for for virtual machine management um, are the ability to. Um, pass through host PCI and USB devices. So I can go go in here to my VM, click on add host device, and I can pass through a USB or PCI device from my host into the VM um, using the web console. So that, that's that's there in Roll 9 beta. Um, another exciting thing that we're, we're gonna have in, in Roll 9, that this is also in the beta right now, is a, a RHEL system role for cockpit. So this will help you mm. Um, you know, basically install and configure cockpit across your environment in an automated manner. So, you know, very, very cool. Um, and then another new thing we're, we're going to have is um, Stratus storage management. So Stratus is a, um, a, 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 a way you can manage Storel. It's a very um, easy to use uh, management system. And we've added that capability into the web console. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that Stratus um, in RHEL 9 is, is still going to be tech preview. So this functionality in the web console is also still tech preview. And it's only visible if you've already enabled um, Stratus um, on the system. You won't see it by default unless you've already enabled that from the command line, just since it's still tech preview functionality. So those are some of the new things to look forward to um, in RHEL 9. And those are available right now in the RHEL 9 beta if you want to try them out. Perfect. And that actually spawned a couple of questions. Uh, the first that I wanted to verbalize was uh, VM management runs over Livert, and that that is correct. Uh, do you have any additional uh, color you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, it's it's it, we're still using uh, Livert um, web web console is basically just a um, you know calling the API for that. So it's just a front you know, front end for your existing VM functionality. Basically, it's it's. It's it's doing the same thing Vert Manager is doing essentially. It's just from you know from a different alternative management interface. Perfect. And then uh, question that I'm actually interested in hearing the answer to as well is does that include GP th GPU pass through? That's a yeah, that's a good question. I am not sure off the top of my head. Now that, that one's one we might have to follow up on, and maybe we could cover that in the in the next episode because I'm not sure what the support is on on GPU pass through. And uh, and will RHEL nine have support for Windows eleven through KVM? Yeah, so I, I believe the only supported virtual machines when you're running on RHEL are RHEL virtual machines. We I know we have a, a case a, a knowledge base article that covers this, and there's different like if you're running under um, Rev Red Hat virtualization, there are additional VMs that are supported like Windows is supported. Um, under under Rev, I believe with OpenShift virtualization, it's also supported. With Rel, I I don't believe it is, but but I'd have to pull up that knowledge base article to check for sure. Yeah, those last two, I was hoping you knew because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I've got to say, as I, I've got a virtual desktop running in my lab, and I would love for certain things to have the ability to easily hand over a GPU. That's just yeah. something I'm lacking in my lab. Um, especially with having uh, having a large family, uh, I've I've even thought about deploying uh, virtual desktops for the family, and then having mouse and keyboard and a monitor everywhere, uh, and then being able to keep the thousand dollars worth of expensive hardware off my five year old's desk. <laughs> But right, uh, right. check check the show uh, check the show notes here in in a few hours. Uh, we'll we'll try and track the answers to those down. And uh, oh, it looks like so, oh yeah, it's like Scott yeah. Scott here has some information. So so Windows Server 2019, 2016, and 2012 are supported as guests on Rel 8 with KVM. So there you okay. go. And, Thanks, do, Scott, and Scott, do we know about the desktop as well? I'm assuming if server can, then I'm I'm assuming the desktop would. But we all know what assumptions are. Um, so 
while while Scott's responding to that, uh, I did want to say that uh, we'll get into a lot more about uh, RHEL 9 and the uh, uh, general availability in the next episode. We've got that coming up here in just a few months. Um, <clears throat> we've got that coming up. Uh, the the GA for RHEL 9 will be a couple of months from now, so we'll, we'll be covering that more and more. But I wanted to uh, highlight that RHEL Presents episode 31 in two weeks will actually be talking about uh, some what to expect with RHEL 9. So things that are changing. Uh, there's a lot of differences in the way that we interact with the firewall. Uh, I wouldn't say really a gotchas episode, but if you're a sysadmin and you're, you're thinking about upgrading from RHEL 8 to RHEL 9 or uh, moving from RHEL 7 to RHEL 9, uh, these, these kind of would be some gotchas. We, we won't call it that, but... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some kind of what to expect. Uh, so that'll that we'll talk about app streams. We'll talk about containers. We'll talk about uh, Brian's possibly favorite topic on on the web console. Um, maybe we'll even get a straight answer on on which is his favorite. But uh, our our guests for uh, for the next episode will actually be Mr. Matthew Yee and Scott McBrien. We're going to bring both of our uh, both of my coworkers back for that one. Um, so that was uh, so I'm I'm excited for that. So please tell your friends, like, subscribe, do all the things uh, to help us grow the show uh, because we are. I don't I don't want to say doubling down, Brian. That that sets a bar awfully high. But we're we're continuing to make investments in the show, in the infrastructure that helps support the show, and we're trying to get more of the engineering and and BU type folks to to come and and join us on the show. Uh, one last thing, I, I, I teased this, uh, I think, in the last episode or the episode before, but I wanted to let you all know that on March 9th, or March 7th, sorry, March 7th, I've got nine on the brain, REL 9. <clears throat> on March 7th, uh, Scott McBrien is going to team up with me, and we're going to launch our how-to show. Uh, we finally came up with a name. It's going to be Into the Terminal, and it's going to be Essential Tasks That You Need to Learn uh, as a systems administrator. So if you're a sysadmin or if you're a developer that needs to log into system boxes, if you're new, if you're a veteran, um, we're, we're going to be wa launching that show on March 7th. So please, if you know people that would benefit from how do I create a user? How do I install the, the web UI? How do I, uh, everyone's favorite, how do I subscribe to a RHEL subscription? So very, very straightforward tasks like that. Uh, every episode is going to have at least one, probably two or more demos. Uh, the first couple of minutes are going to be very, very direct. This is how you create a user. These are the... Uh... <laughs> um, so Scott actually came up with the idea, um, and he asked me, and that was his mistake of, of, of asking me to, to help, because I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. And then we were both like, oh, we should probably do the thing now. So yes, that, that is official. Into the Terminal is coming to a YouTube channel near you or Twitch uh, on March 7th. Uh, before we wrap, uh, Brian, anything you want to share? No, no. Um, yeah, just if you haven't looked at the web console in a while, um, definitely take a look, try it out, and um, let us know if you have any feedback on it. Yes, we love your feedback. In fact, just this morning on an upgrade from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8 video, I uh, actually got asked a question about Ansible automation. And uh, in regards to the upgrade, I didn't know the answer. I passed that to the engineering team and actually started getting some some back and forth between engineers, myself, and and the commenter. So we do, we do hear you. We do look at the comments. Uh, so please get involved. This is... This is I mean, Brian's one of the product managers. I'm one of the technical marketers. So by all means, hang with us. Tell your friends. Join the show live. In fact, a lot of your questions are are awesome. We have great questions in, in our chat because of uh, uh, because of you all being here. Uh, things that even make it into some of the marketing content, uh, some of the decks, some of the videos. Uh, we take your questions and we we ask: is, is this something we should write a blog on? So of course we have Brian Smith, Mr. Blog himself. Um, Anyway, I, I, will, uh, I will let you all go. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We'll see you in two weeks live on YouTube for episode 31, where we'll talk about uh, what to expect with RHEL 9. But until then, thank you, Brian. I appreciate your time. Thank you to Scott and Matthew who are hanging out with us today. And I, I saw Terry as well. So thank you to Red Hatters who hung out and helped us answer questions. Until then, we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>